Hi, welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined once again by the delightful Dr. Richard Beck. We'll be speaking about his marvelous new book, which is on re-enchantment in a secular age, named Haunting Magic Ales, Recovering an Enchanted Faith in a Skeptical Age. So first of all, can you tell us what you mean by enchantment, Richard, and um, what role does attention in particular play in our so-called meaning crisis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so enchantment and disenchantment are words I'm borrowing from the kind of sociological literature. The words became um, a focus of conversation after Charles Taylor wrote the book A Secular Age, where he traces the journey in the Western world, at least, from an enchanted age 500 years ago, the world was enchanted and we moved into an increasingly disenchanted age. So enchantment is grabbing uh, a hold of the idea of a culture that the supernatural was taken as manifestly obvious. God's existence was a given. The world was full of the miraculous and the supernatural and not just um, the existence of God and angelic presidents, uh, presences, the miracles of, of wonder-working saints, but also occult forces, uh, witchcraft, the occult, uh, uh, demonic forces. So that, when we, when we grab the word enchantment, we're talking about basically the a robust experience and imagination for the supernatural and the miraculous and the spiritual. But our world has been described by sociologists of religion as increasingly disenchanted. So as we know in the West, we are in a post-Christian era. Rates of atheism, agnosticism um, are on the rise. And uh, so we struggle more with faith and doubt, uh, question the existence of God. And even, and even among the faithful, there is a sense where belief in God, even for the faithful, feels uh, contestable, um, challengeable, uh, more fragile. Um, it, it's, it's a faith rather than as a kind of a cultural default is kind of on the front edges of my mind as a, as a choice that I'm consciously making to believe. And that itself changes the, the, the texture of faith because it has to be constantly chosen and rechosen and therefore can be opted out of. And so that, I, that idea that one could even opt in and opt out of a faith is, is a kind of a modern example of disenchantment. And the way the spiritual um, life is characterized almost now like a marketplace, I can kind of pick and choose the enchantments, the beliefs, and, and kind of curate my own personal uh, spiritual path forward. Maybe I dabble a little bit here in Christianity, but I mix it with some other things. So, so that's that's what I mean by enchantment and disenchantment. Um, and the the second part of your question about attention um, is an argument I'm borrowing from the theologian uh, Andrew Root, who makes this argument um, in a book called "A Pastor in a Secular Age." That normally what we take to be a crisis of belief, that, that that's what we're experiencing in this secular age, a crisis of belief. I find it more difficult to believe in, in, in God. He argues it's more a crisis of attention, that God hasn't gone anywhere, but we have lost our ability to, to see and recognize and name God's very obvious uh, presence. And he uses this experiment in psychology that illustrates what psychologists call attention blindness, observation blindness, or attention blindness. Uh, your listeners might have seen that famous uh, uh, YouTube clip where there are two basketball teams, one dressed in white, one in black, and they pass a basketball back and forth. And you're told by the narrator to, to count the number of passes the teams make back and forth. And so the teams scramble and the ball's going back and forth, back and forth. You're counting the passes. You get to the end of the video and it says, how many passes did you see? You say 15, they say, correct. But did you see the, the dancing gorilla? <laughs> and have you ever seen that clip? Yeah, <laughs> I looked yeah. it up after I read your book. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, but if you know, if you know the, if you know, it's kind of like the joke. If you know the punchline, you're going to see it. But but yeah. if you've ever seen it, millions of people have seen it, and they and they they remember counting the passes, but they they didn't see this dancing gorilla. Mm -hmm. 
And um, because in the middle of the passing teams, a guy in a grill suit comes out, does a dance and, and, and goes off. And, and it's illustrating what's called attention blindness, where your attention is focusing your perception on one part of reality, but the most obvious thing about your perception, right? The most obvious thing on the screen is a dancing gorilla. It's right in front of you. And yet you're, you've been blinded by it because of your attentional process. And Andrew Root argues that that's what's happened in our secular age. That's what's driving disenchantment, not a crisis of belief, but a crisis of attention. We're paying attention to the world in different ways now and, and the sacred thing, the dancing gorilla, if you will, that might be heretical to compare God to a dancing gorilla, <laughs> but the, uh, the obvious thing is, is the thing we're now blinded to. So my book is about this crisis of attention and how we might kind of cultivate or practice our way back to a new form of attention that would cause, that would allow us to re-enchant our faith, that God's presence becomes again, obvious uh, and real and present um, in our day-to-day -day experience. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Richard. And um, something quite interesting and surprising you show is how well-intentioned arguments actually for God's existence have actually played a part in this disenchantment. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, one of the interesting stories I tell is how um, arguments that were created to, to prove God's existence might have had some unwitting, unforeseen consequences. And the argument I focus in on is what's called the argument from design or the, the watchmaker argument. So it's a famous argument that the Christians have used for generations. And it goes like this. If you were walking along a beach and you found a pocket watch um, and you opened the pocket watch and you saw the intricately designed gears, then the evidence of that design um, would point to an intelligence that created it. And so where there is a watch, there must be a watchmaker. And Christians have used that argument to kind of argue that hey, we look at the intricate design of, of creation, the laws of the cosmos, the intricate workings of the human body and brain, that, 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 that doesn't look random. That looks like it was created by an intelligence. So therefore the cosmos is this watch and it points to a watchmaker, to a creator God. And so on one level, that might be a plausible argument for some people, but I, I pointed out that that argument um, kind of unwittingly supported a Newtonian imagination. And by Newtonian imagination, a, a world governed by uh, Newtonian mechanics, that the, the cosmos for the first time was no longer seen as a miracle, but more as a machine. And the minute the cosmos became a machine, running lawfully and deterministically with the laws of physics, right? Once God kind of, maybe he makes the watch and he winds it up at the big bang and then he lets it go and then steps back and it runs on its own. And that's the key issue. It's now running on its own separately, independently, autonomously from God where, you know, in the enchanted past, um, the way Dante looked at it was when he, when he gets to the final lines of uh, the divine comedy, he looks at the stars and he sees the love, the love that moves the sun and the stars. That's how our enchanted ancestors saw the world, that, that, that the world was held in being by the love and the grace of God. There, there was a stunning miracle that was right in front of us, right? That's the dancing gorilla. Creation itself was this inexplicable miracle that should just stun us in awe and you see this in the psalms right how the how the creation declares the handiwork of god but we don't see it we don't see the miracle we see the laws of physics we see the machine running uh independently of god and so basically that watchmaker argument i argue kind of is deistic god, god creates the world and steps back from it so that's kind of an irony that this this very, this argument that was developed to prove the existence of God actually distances God from us in imagination and gives us a more of a mechanistic view of the way we see the cosmos.
Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Richard. I think um, something really interesting happening now alongside your book is um, Stephen Meyer's new book, which is The Return of the God Hypothesis, but his claim is going beyond that deism. He's trying to get back to theism at least and then show the personal workings of God throughout different cosmological um, events and the origin of humans and all this kind of stuff, which is fascinating to me. And um, another surprising claim, I think, from your book is um, about how social justice, for example, has actually played a part in disenchanting the world. Can you tell us a bit about that and how that has um, progressed or degressed, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the other argument I make in the book, and again, this is borrowed from many scholars, Charles Taylor being among them, is how the Protestant Reformation, now I'm, I'm speaking as a Protestant, so this is aimed at my own uh, tribe, how the Protestant Reformation itself uh, facilitated the disenchantment of the world in this way. I describe it in the book as the mystical to moral shift, where in the enchanted and the orthodox experience, the 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 liturgy itself, the relationship between um, the, the, the human person and the sacraments was very enchanted, um, uh, mystical. In, in fact, even to this day, Protestants will look at Catholic and orthodox spiritualities as a little bit too spooky right a little <laughs> a little too enchanted yeah uh, a little too superstitious um so there's that so that was that enchanted mystical supernatural experience and protestantism introduced a a moralism into the christian faith uh where where holiness and piety now that's not to say that piety and moral performance wasn't but but that that became a kind of a central defining feature of a Protestant faith that my relationship with God is fundamentally about a piety, not an encounter with God in the sacraments. That was the enchanted experience, and still is to this day, where I encounter God in an enchanted way through a sacramental encounter. Uh, in Protestantism, the sacraments became disenchanted. So my church, you know, we still have the Lord's Supper or communion, we call it. But it, um, it's not a miracle. It's not a supernatural moment. It's it's a, more of a memory. We remember Jesus. And again, that's that's a distant, distancing kind of imagination. We're remembering something that happened a long time ago, and um, and and conjure up positive feelings about that. Well, in the Orthodox and Catholic traditions, no, the, the participation in the Eucharist is a a, a mystical encounter with a divine reality that is present in the room, in the space. And so again, God has been brought near again in that, in that kind of sacramental imagination. And then, so then you take that moralistic impulse amongst the Protestants and you just keep pushing it. You just keep pushing the moral um, and, and, and divested of God. And then you eventually just get to the social justice movement where the, the entire point of Christianity is, um, uh, being on the right side of history, uh, standing up for the oppressed. And I want to be very, very clear that, that I think that is a huge part of the Christian witness. But when social justice becomes the sole aim of the Christian faith, and in Christian context, it's not maybe not described that way. It, it might be just simply described as like being like Jesus, you know. And so the whole point of being like Jesus is to be a, a, um, a good, loving, compassionate person that stands up for the oppressed so however you unpack it when, when being good is the goal no longer an encounter with god but being good is the goal then then as i describe in the book then then faith is put in a very fragile position because the question that gets asked next is well do i have to believe in god to be good uh, or as my students might say it can't an atheist be as good as a Christian? And the answer to those questions are obvious. Yes, you can be, there are non-believers who are very good people. There are non-believers that are even better people than some of the Christians sitting in, in the pews. And, and if being good is the goal then, then, then the, the entire faith becomes kind of optional. You can opt out of it. So, so that was another big story in the book about how the Protestant Reformation introduced this kind of moralism and that that moralism, which eventually gets cast out as political activism, comes to displace uh, the central location of God in our lives and, and therefore the church and the sacraments and the, the other enchanted aspects of our faith.
Yeah, excellent. I appreciate that as well. And um, I think didn't Chesterton say that was the virtues run amok? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, you describe in the, the book, The Ache, as it's called, um, mm -hmm. what are some of its ill effects and how can enchantment to be, uh, begin to heal our ache? So um, the ache, I describe the ache to kind of gather up just the the general observation that uh, believers and non-believers pretty much agree on, which is we're not doing very well um, in the Western world. And by that, I mean, we see rates of uh, de depression and anxiety and suicide and uh, uh, addiction all on the rise. And so there, there is definitely a spiritual, emotional unease in the modern world. And that is what I call the ache. And I begin the book with the ache because I think we have lost our ability to name um, God's presence in our life, but we can definitely name the pain we feel when God has gone missing. And so my students, they might not be able to name their desire for God, but they can definitely name their anxiety. And so that part of the book is my attempt to, to link the secular age, our, our loss of a transcendent ground of being that gives our lives kind of a sacred uh, weight and a sacred significance that gives our identities um, um, a, a ground of dignity and value, even when we struggle to meet metrics of success, right? So even if I'm a failure, um, I, I don't get into my preferred uh, university, or I, or I don't get the promotion of my job, or I, I face unemployment because of COVID, or my spouse divorces me, right? Like, like life hits me with a series of setbacks. And I feel like in the metrics of the world, my life is becoming worthless. That there has to be some kind of metaphysical safety net to kind of say, no, uh, you and your life matters. And it matters just in this kind of sacred recognition, almost as an article of faith, a, a metaphysical kind of given. And in, 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 in Christianity, right? Um, that's just that conviction that God created you and that you are a child of God and God knows your name and, and that your tears are not just wasted on the cosmos, but God, in the language of the Psalms, God puts all of our tears in a bottle, like he catches all the pain. And so my private struggles to just get through the day has a kind of a cosmic witness um that says i see you when nobody else sees you i sees you and and so when we've lost that transcendent ground of being then then we become vulnerable psychologically to feeling worthless or disposable or discard discardable in in this culture right I, i'm not contributing so therefore my life doesn't matter and what's fascinating about that is that this is an observation that even secular journalists are, are making. I just read an article the other day in a secular outlet where the person was saying one of the struggles with Gen Z, right, the youngest generation right now, is that they, they are having a crisis of meaning, um, uh, especially during COVID, that they're the, the, the ladder into a successful career has been broken, that, that they're having trouble entering into industry because everything's shut down right now. And so they're just kind of spinning their wheels during this season of social distancing and quarantine. They got no viable prospects for careers. And so they're kind of feeling lost. And um, and so this, this writer described it as a kind of a crisis of meaning. Well, that's exactly where God fits in, in our psychic uh and psychological health. So to me, the ache is, is just naming the, the, the hole, the pain where God has gone missing in the modern world. And so it's naming our thirst and our desire for God. And unfortunately, we can't name that directly. So we have to speak in the language of mental health. 
Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm. And um, then something you offer in response to this in line with what you said is the importance of mystical experience and how that actually forms the bedrock of the Christian life. Can you tell us a bit about that and how that plays out? Yeah, so I think, again, a lot of us think that, you know, being a Christian is believing in things. And so going back to this idea of belief versus attention. Um, but in the modern world, right, the plausibility structures of Christianity are, are weaker. And so it seems like the, the leap from disbelief or skepticism or doubt to belief is, is just a huge gap. I can't just jump. And so... Um, as I describe it to my students, we feel that the demand of Christianity is to force yourself to believe in unbelievable things. So, you know, God, I can't believe, believe in God is, that's just implausible to me. And so I got to go from this far, you know, side of the canyon and just jump across to believing in this thing. And, <laughs> and belief, belief can't be conjured up by an act of will. And so, the, the focus on enchantment, though, the focus on attention suggests that if, if, however, belief is driven by experience, then if I re-attend to my life or practice these different ways of attention, where I, I, I am now bumping into God on a more regular basis, and my eyes and ears and senses are more alert to the divine presence, then as I encounter those mystical experiences, as God shows up in big and small ways in my daily life, then suddenly um, those experiences are creating plausibility structures. They're, they're making the belief in God seem more intuitive, more reasonable. So to me, that's what the book is trying to do is like, instead of just saying, hey, just believe this, just, just it's a pill you just got to swallow. But if you can re-narrate or re-attend to the, the sacred in your life, then belief becomes um, easier. The gap becomes is closed between disbelief and belief. So it's a focus on experience because I think experience is kind of where faith is birthed from. Excellent. Thank you for that, Richard. And um, I think too in line with that at a societal level for me, whenever I became a Christian too, you sort of have to wrestle with um, obviously the experience of the people in history before us and the fact that these claims were public and they are falsifiable, at least by the methodology of history and everything, which helped me to sort of, whenever you know that and learn that, then that helps reaff on top of what you're saying mm -hmm. to add another dimension, which I think is important for people. But um, so I want to ask you next then, you speak about the, some people think this disenchantment notion is a myth, but you say that it is important that we do recognize at least some form of disenchantment that has taken place. Can you tell us a bit about that and um, why it's important? Yeah, so Charles Taylor kind of tells this story in a secular age that we've been on the journey from enchantment to disenchantment, uh, right? Uh, from a, a supernatural experience to the secular uh, scientific age that we currently live in. And, and since the publication of his book, some people have pushed back upon that narrative and they call it the myth of disenchantment. And the myth of disenchantment is just to point out kind of something that's pretty obvious, which is yes, atheism and agnosticism has been on the rise, but it's still a minority view. Um, at least in the US, rates of atheism and Gnosticism are maybe around like 25%. So people who are kind of opting out of religion. So if you think about, right, um, where, you know, your context, right? So the churches are increasingly empty, but it's not like people are just becoming atheists. They're dabbling in and experiencing in all sorts of um, a neo pagan um, or other new age spiritualities. Um, people still believe in ghosts or karma. Um, uh, people are still attracted to supernatural movies and fiction <laughs> and, uh, and, and science fiction. And so it, it doesn't seem like people are opting for just outright Richard Dawkins skepticism. Some are. So, it, so what we're describing here is what's called the kind of the spiritual but not religious shift. So de de decreased beliefs in traditional 
religious practice, but now for more of a vague free floating spirituality. And, um, and so it's kind of, uh, I taught describe it in the book as kind of a rise in um, the pagan imagination. And I borrow from Stephen Smith, a book of his, where he says that the main contrast between Christianity and paganism is the location of the sacred. And Christian enchantment tends to locate the sacred in a transcendent creator, that there, the sacred comes to us from the outside. A pagan enchantment is more, a, he, he, he describes it as an imminent enchantment, that creation itself is, is holy and sacred. So you see the, the rise of kind of nature religions and neo-paganism with its uh, embrace of kind of the creational goods. And so I think I find that a helpful way because when you speak of paganism, people are like, well, we're not sacrificing, you know, to the pagan gods. You know? <laughs> Although some are right. People get into Norse mythology or Celtic spirit. You know, they, yeah. there are some of that. But but there is a g- general sense where people are looking for like a spirituality that is within the creator creation realm so we don't we're declining in that belief that there's a god above us that 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 transcendent enchantment is what's being um turned away from for these more imminent creational uh spiritualities yep excellent thank you richard and um all nuances aside you do point out a certain kind of protestantism which um has played the role in disenchanting space time people in the church going through mm-hmm. each of those and you speak about um as you mentioned before the miracle of the lord's supper and point to the fact that memory isn't enough can you tell us a bit more about that and the importance of a sacramental worldview as you describe in the book for protestants and others alike yeah yeah so um so the sacramental imagination it is, and, and to push back upon what I just said, is that is that the sacramental imagination has always argued that God isn't just transcendent, that it is a mixture of the transcendent and the imminent. And sacramental, uh, a sacramental ontology is that idea that God is uh, interpenetrating all of all of existence. And so this is Paul in his sermon in Acts to the Athenians, where he says, um, this unknown God, right, the dancing gorilla, the thing you can't see, is actually everywhere, because it's in him we move, live, and have our being. And, and so that, that a sacramental ontology draws our attention to the way the sacred isn't that watchmaker argument that we talked about, you know, God start the deistic imagination of God is far away. It is the sense that God is the heir that we are breathing. He is the ocean of being that we are swimming in. And, and that sacramental, and, and so that, uh, that we see that most clearly in this, in sacraments of so like baptism and in Eucharist and other sacraments where God is coming to us through the material realm. Um, and the trouble, like, like, uh, the, the material, God is God's presence is mediated, mediated to us through material things. And in Protestantism, what you see is more of a, a, a stricter divide between the spiritual and material. God is just in the spiritual realm and we live in the material realm. So there's that there's that separation um, again. And that therefore means that the spiritual is always what's invisible. And again, that distances us from God, because if it's invisible, then it's not real. It's only the, you know, the matter, you know, knocking on my computer screen here, right? It's the physical thing that's real. So I think recovering the sacramental ontology helps us recover that that, the interconnection between the spiritual and the material. But importantly, I think it also gives us resources for enchantment, especially for Protestants that don't have a tradition of, uh, sacramental reminders so like in my office here i have a crucifix upon my my wall up there Mm -hmm. um which is unusual for protestant to have uh because but i found that large crucifix there which is right across my desk over here to be an important material reminder of a spiritual reality and so that kind of the materiality of the sacramental imagination um, is it just a theolo- you know, we could talk about sacramental ontology and completely geek out on that. Mm-hmm. But to me, the practical 
spiritual formation import is uh, physical objects help mediate the divine presence to us. And that can be useful to us if we're trying to re-enchant our spaces. Yeah, excellent. And um, I think maybe from my own personal experience, maybe tying some of this together, whenever I returned to the Christian faith, it was actually kind of serendipitous by God's grace, thankfully. So I was reading books about Sufi mysticism and things like that. And one of the footnotes actually had a reference to Orthodox iconography and the theology behind icons. And whenever I read that, I was like, this makes paramount sense to me. This makes a lot more sense than the transcended otherness and unknowability of the way Allah is described in Islam. And I guess it speaks to something similar within at least a certain kind of Protestantism. Although I think in line with your work, there are some wonderful exceptions like um, Peter Leithart's Theopolis kind of work. Mm -hmm. I love that. And he's approaching the world sacramentally and so on. And um, I want to ask you next, returning to something we spoke about before. So we said about the, the moral impulse. How is the secular culture hijacked the moral impulse of the Christian faith? And what are some of the ways that we are seeing that sort of play out now? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of a lot of people have made some arguments um, that that what we're seeing in the secular age is just the logical trajectory of Protestant Christianity, at least in America, at least, um, to where the 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 moral becomes increasingly unpacked as political, and and therefore the political is the goal, and then as as disenchantment settles in then what we're seeing in America isn't necessarily post-Christian, but post-Protestant, where we have capped the moral sensibility um, of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, that that uh, love is like, so one, I was going to say, I was going to make a reference here to uh, John Lennon, but I'm borrowing this from Tom Holland's work. So if you're if your listeners don't know Tom Holland's work, um, especially his book Dominion, that this is his argument. He goes that the 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 ethic of modern secular humanism um, owes everything to the Judeo Christian tradition. So when John Lennon sings, "All you need is love," which is kind of the zeitgeist of um, the, that's the zeitgeist of the modern liberal age, right? We just need to love everybody. Well, well, like, where does John Lennon get that? Like, 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 who put love on the radar screen of the West? In the and it wasn't the Romans. Mm -hmm. um, they they had a very different ethic. They they exalted the strong and the powerful. Um, it was the Christian tradition that said God is love. Um, you know, and, and you can go back to the, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? Uh, Leviticus, to, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Holland just argues that we have capped in the West, in the guise of humanism or liberalism or progressivism, um, the ethical fruits of Christianity, but stripped out the metaphysics, which creates a question which is whether or not that is a, vi a viable whether that's going to be viable going forward can you can the ethical fruits of the west inherited from christianity sustain themselves because right now we're just surviving on kind of a cultural inertia um but that's we're very young in that project but as the metaphysics fade can that can that can that moral consensus hold um, given, given the various uh, threats that could, could appear, um, you know, in the future? Um, and so that's a live question. And so some of your listeners might know Alistair McIntyre's work after virtue. And so he's one of these critics that say, hey, you know, I don't know if the moral vision of the West is going to survive um, too much longer. Um, without uh, some metaphysical commitments that these are like non-negotiable um, because if there's nothing that grounds them as non-negotiables then they're negotiable and it, and and that, maybe that may sound like christian fear-mongering like i'm like wringing my hands and worried about this but but i think we see examples of this for example <laughs> like um think about genetic engineering mm -hmm. 
um, we're only we're a real short step away to kind of saying, hey, I can like show up at the baby shop, you know, and the and the the, the genetic engineer will say like, hey, your 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 child like you want them to have your mom's eyes, your dad's eyes. You're like, no, I like let's give them dad's eyes. Do you want to give them dad's athletic ability or mom's musical ability or both? We're like, well, let's do both. I mean, mm -hmm. like we're getting to the point where the that that we can kind of basically optimize human and that might seem all to the good but but what does it mean about a person that um struggles with a disability um what what is the divine status of somebody who has down syndrome um or people who have injuries and they you know can't perform well right right what like like what grounds human dignity um uh, in a way that can't be kind of modified by scientific tinkering. And so that's just, just one random example of where um, if we don't have some sacred commitments about what is human value and worth and, and, and that, that uh, scientific advancements can kind of tinker on the edges and we can find ourselves in a very different future in 100, 200 years. Um, so that's just one example of like how the the current moral consensus might subtly change over time. Yeah, excellent. And um, your fellow Protestant scholar, actually, who I really like, Nancy Pearcy, she writes about that and how the modern personhood theory is actually very dehumanizing and targets disabled people and different things. And um, mm -hmm. how they're even erasing the category of woman, for example, in this move towards a more transhuman perspective. And plus, the, uh, as far as I can see, it's, there's no binding universal moral vision and more than moral vision but vision that can speak out against that if it's not revealed from outside of the system as it were i think in line with your work and even people like habermas the secularist uh, philosopher he seems to have realized that and obviously he started a dialogue with um pope benedict and everything too mm -hmm. so i think that's all very important and um I want to ask you next, because I think your work is actually something of a black pill to use the internet <laughs> kind of lingo, but also a white with the white pill of re-enchantment. So um, you mentioned before the ache and how this is actually the first step towards re-enchantment. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a bit about that? How, how the ache is the first step toward re-enchantment? Yes. Yeah, well, again, I think we begin, like I was saying before, with like the with the restlessness. So this is just an it's an Augustinian move, you know. Uh, Saint Augustine says our hearts are restless until they rest in God. So we begin with the restlessness, and and I think you can get agreement there. So I think G.K. Chesterton famously said, you know, that original sin is the most empirically verifiable doctrine of the Christian faith, yeah. and I would like to change it because I think. I think the moralistic vision of original sin um, has lost some of its cultural power, right? A Christian showing up and kind of saying, we're all sinners, you know, be like, ah, okay, Christians, there you go with your kind of puritanical judgment. But if you shift it to the ache, that there, that, that there is a, just a generalized restlessness, I think like, like for my students, they might struggle to believe in God but I can begin with their anxiety. Like, are you anxious? And yeah, they're anxious. They're willing to admit that. And I'm like, well, why, why are you so anxious? Like, what, where is that coming from? Do you struggle with guilt or shame? And they're like, yeah, I struggle with that too. Well, where is that coming from? Um, and so to me, I begin with the restlessness of the modern experience because it, it creates a thirst for for God, uh, for some, uh, a medicine, if you will. Um, and I find that a, a better move. Um, now, now, there's some worries there because uh, you don't want to say, well, believe in God because it, God's a happy pill. Um, so, so I want to be nuanced and critical about mm -hmm. that move. But I, I do think you can begin a conversation about the spiritual life by beginning with, the uh, the restlessness of the modern world. Yeah, excellent. And um, what does the word hollow mean, which you describe in the book? And how can we then come to attend once again to sacred moments that we might experience? 
Yeah. So one of the ways we experience, I think, the ache is that we um, have to create what I describe in the book as like a sacred texture. Like, like life has to have levels to it. Um, we have to have sacred highs and we have to have sacred depth. Otherwise, um, modern, the modern neo-capitalist experience is very shallow because we just feel like my life has nothing of kind of sacred significance beyond the next Netflix binge I go on. Yeah. And I think COVID revealed that to a lot of us that we had, we were able to kind of distract ourselves from the shallowness of our lives when we could go out to pubs and to restaurants and go out to the next Marvel movie, you know, like we, you know, the going out, being with friends, hang, you know, like, like we could pass days, months and years of our lives just doing the next thing, right? Ne you know, going to the next movie, hanging out, you know, meeting friends on a Friday night, like, like decades of our lives could pass. But then when COVID shut all that down, a lot of us kind of just saw this big vacuum in their lives that my life had been filled with entertainment. And when I couldn't entertain myself, I didn't have any, anything inside, uh, you know, like, and, and what, what's the point of life anymore to just sit at home and uh, like the, the, and, and, so, so all that to say is um, the way I describe it to my students is like, we want our lives to be high stakes. Like we, we want to, we want to be playing in a game uh, where uh, things matter. Um, and, but the only way to do that is to hallow. And by hallow, I mean, some things have to, some, some things in life just have to be set aside. And that's what, hallow means to make or holy and and holy means set apart some things in life have to be set apart as sacred holy significant in a way that the rest of life doesn't matter and and i point out that this is a universal human activity even um atheists have to hallow you know we hallow uh births and we hallow uh deaths and we and we hallow moments of tragedy like if there's a tragic accident or uh where there's mass casualties we will flock to those locations and hallow them with flowers and vigils and that's fascinating right here's all of this massive you know we even use the word vigil that's 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 a that's an enchanted word from the religious past and so here we have these kind of godless secular you know cultures having vigils and lighting candles i mean there's no god right but but yet we engage in this mass practice of liturgy um and and we don't pray but we will have a moment of silence yeah you know but but what i'm saying but so we're, we're kind of still this is that cultural inertia thing i was talking about we're still borrowing from our Christian past to hallow in this kind of secular way, but the but the impulse to say what happened it the, what happened here needs to be set apart for kind of a collective moment of sacred recognition, deeply human activity. We we, we have to do it, um, and we have to celebrate. We have to uh, sing and and uh, light our candles and to be silent and pray. Um, because that's that's a that's a human life. Otherwise, um, your life is just going to be Amazon selling you stuff, <laughs> right? That's the only thing you live for. It is the next package to show up at the door, or the next movie that is available for streaming. And I think a lot of us are looking at that, going like, that seems like a really shallow life. Oh man! <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, in line with that, you describe something which might surprise people. Um, of happiness, not so-called, not being the, the right goal. Can you tell us about why happiness is actually quite um, destructive if it's made the ultimate? Yeah. So, so you know, happiness um, shares the same root as the word happens, and so this is kind of you know um, catechesis or Sunday school one hundred and one, right? That happiness is 
what happens to us. And so happiness is um, conditional. Uh, I'm happy if, you know, I get, I get what I want. But if I don't get what I want, then I'm unhappy. And so I'm happy and I'm unhappy and I'm up and I'm down. And I kind of connect that to kind of the more durable virtues of gratitude and, and joy. Um, and also um, a kind of a, a ground of dignity and worth that transcends self-esteem. Because self-esteem itself is a, a contingent metric. Um, I, I, I described in, you know, William James, the famous American psychologist, you know, over a hundred years ago said that self-esteem um, is a metric that measures the ratio of your um, aspirations, um, your successes to your aspirations. Basically, self-esteem is the is the is the measure of the gap between your ideal and your actual right here's what i want my aspirations my dreams my goals my desires here's here's what i got and if i if those are close i feel good self esteem but if they're far away or i have low self esteem and so self esteem becomes a measure of the gap of dissatisfaction in my life well i mean if you any I mean, three seconds of thought realize, well, if that is the therapeutic recommendation of our modern world, that you have to have good self-esteem, but self-esteem is fundamentally a metric of dissatisfaction, then is it any surprise to anybody that we're having massive mental health problems in the modern world? Because we're, we're putting happiness upon a very contingent metric of dissatisfaction and saying that's the secret of mental health is to have a good self-esteem. But self-esteem is never stable. It's constantly moving given how this metric of ideal versus actual is. And so if, if you know, here's the life I want and here's the life I got. And if I'm drifting away from that, well, of course, I'm going to feel anxious and depressed and suicidal and, 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 and try to mask it with drugs. I mean, that that's, obvious to us and so we have to have a better ground that something that is a more durable um, ground of joy than happiness right something that is unconditioned that is steady and set uh, no matter what my circumstances are otherwise um, I'm playing this roller coaster ride swinging between the highs and the lows of modern life yeah, excellent. And um, what role does social media then play in this spiritual malady? And how does it exacerbate some of those um, concerns that you have there? Yeah, and I'm not the first to point out that social media is just gasoline on this fire, right? So, so we've always lived with this metric of comparison. So the ideal is often an ideal relative to where I am. And my ideals are often, you know, people that I see, like uh, they're, they're you know, their successes. And so self-esteem is not just performative, but it's also comparative. Um, what I have relative to everybody else. So we've always known that that was a thing. And then social media was invented. And now we have a constant access to these highly selective and curated images um, of, of our peers. And, and we all know this, that we're not putting on Instagram or Facebook or uh, TikTok or whatever, you know, our worst selves, we're always kind of putting on our best selves. And so we're constantly comparing my life to this life of my friend who looks like they got, you know, there they are, there they are on their beach vacation. And there they are like with their spouse and their family. And, and, um, and, and I'm like, well, my life pales in comparison. And so, so psychologists have kind of documented the rise of our um, emotional dysfunction with the kind of constant comparative metric that we're feeding off of um, because of social media. And a lot of people think that this is a large part of the rise of mental dysfunction amongst teenagers because they are just awash in social comparison and um, with social media. And uh, they're more depressed than they have ever been um, in the history of the world. Yep, excellent. And I just finished another book, actually, um, Post-Christian by Gene Veith, and he talks about even 
the sheer proliferation of information on the internet and the fact that it's hard to discriminate between different kinds of information. You've got tragedy one minute, you've got something banal the next minute and everything. And um, young people with no sacred center or who aren't living a proper embodied existence, especially in a community where they're supported and everything, they're just bombarded with all of this information. What are they to do that the, the modern self isn't um, thick enough to deal with that? Yeah. So um, I want to ask you then in line with that, how does the Christian conception of this or understanding of the soul contrast with our modern notion of the self? If you can look at it that way. Yeah, this is something that was put on my radar screen um, from uh, Eve Poole. She's a, a, in the UK, writes a lot about the intersection of, um, of faith and theology and economics. She wrote a great book called Capitalism's Toxic Assumptions. Um, but, but Eve, uh, in a conversation I had with her, was, was we were talking about the idea of the loss of the human. And, and she kind of connects that to with the rise of kind of artificial intelligence, where in the technological world, right, we, we see intelligence um, as, a, uh, as a skill. Um, and and she argues that kind of the, the rise of this kind of technological vision of the person um, is, is produced by disenchantment because we've lost track of what an enchanted past was obvious, which is that humans are possessed of a soul. And, and, and so the soul kind of named the part of the sacred part of us. We talked about hallowing before, right? That was the hallowed part of us. Yeah, there's my brain and my body and but humans were possessed of a soul, kind of a spiritual center. And, and she argues that with the decline of that belief, that is we, we give ourselves over to a, kind of more of a medical or a neuroscientific vision of human personhood, that we are reducing people to a set of capacities or functions that can be optimized, like with artificial intelligence or like you're talking about transhumanism. So the human is just a series of capacities or skills that could be enhanced. The soul, however, is, is not a, it's not a capacity or a skill. It is just a, it, it's, it's the sacred aspect of a person that is inviolable. You, like it cannot be uh, commodified. Let's put it that way. It cannot be turned into some sort something that is useful for some consumeristic end. And, and so, and what's interesting about the soul is that even though we live in this kind of post-Christian age, again, I think we're still haunted by God. Like, I think if you stood out in a corner and just did a, a random question of passersby, do you think you have a soul? I think the majority of people would say, yes, I have a soul. So, so there is this kind of still echo, even in the secular world, um, of a of of god right we still hear the voice of god that, like like even non-believers think they got a soul um and I, to me again that's just kind of the inertia of christendom persisting into the secular world yep thank you for that richard i want to ask you next about um johnny cash who you've made me fall <laughs> in love with <laughs> so hey this is my go. johnny cash that's my Johnny Cash collection over there. I don't know, Amazing. you know, yeah, those are the my vinyl collection of Johnny Cash. Oh, wonderful. And um, <laughs> yeah, as I say, you've made me fall in love with him um, recently, especially. So I'm very grateful for that. I want to ask you about how, um, about him, his, his experiences at Naked Jack Cave and, and what this really means in line with your the thesis of your book. Yeah, so I tell the story um, in, in Hunting Magic Eels, um, but, but it's a story I actually talked about in my, my, the book before, uh, Trains Jesus and Murder, the Gospel According to Johnny Cash, about how when he was at a really low point in his life, at, at, in the grip of his addiction, had just been divorced from his first wife, how he became suicidal. And he went to Nickajack Cave in Tennessee with the plan to just crawl back into the cave system until his battery, battery uh, burned out on his uh, flashlight. Um, and get so lost in the cave system that he couldn't find his way back out. So it's kind of this really weird suicide plan to just crawl back into this cave and die in the darkness. And so he does. He cr crawls back into the cave, flashlight goes out, and he lays down in the darkness wanting to die. 
And he tells the story about how um, he hears the voice of God in that darkness. And he hears God say, I am still here. Uh, where Cash had felt that he had wandered off from God and was far from God, um, God had never left. Um, again, this is Paul in Athens. Like, in, in God, we live and move and have our being. Like, God, you can't be far from God. It, it's, um, as Augustine said, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. Like, you can't be far from God. It's impossible. Psychically, you can feel far from God, but the ontological reality is, you know, God's always there. Anyway, he heard the voice of God in the cave, and that that was one of his conversion experiences that that kind of pulled him out of his addiction and, and, and turned his life around. And so, so I use Cash's experience of hearing the voice of God to, to talk about how um, God shows up in these experiences in our life. But I also try to, in that particular chapter, try to widen the view, because a lot of us, when we think about encountering God, and I have friends that are this way, who say, I've never heard God speak directly to me, the way Johnny Cash did. Um, so I guess God isn't there, you know, for me. And so I begin with Johnny Cash and say, you know, that's kind of like one of those classic experiences that we hear about. We hear the voice of the Lord. Uh, we have an angelic visitation. And and there are many people who have had those experiences. And if you just inventory people of faith and say, have you heard the voice of God? Do you think you've ever encountered an angel unawares? The stories will come. You know, the, the, the stories will come. But then there's other people that haven't had those experiences. So how does God show up for them? And, and that's kind of where I spend most of that chapter trying to kind of draw attention to the sacred in ways that might seem not obviously supernatural. Yeah, excellent. And can you tell us about um, this eccentric element of which you speak, uh, this outward facing element? And um, what are some of the stages that we might go through, like uh, Pascal, who you mentioned in the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I borrow the term eccentric experiences from the theologian David Kelsey. Um, and I just love his use of the word eccentric, because um, when we hear the word, we think of kind of unusual or peculiar, right? This is an eccentric experience. And um, I kind of play with that idea in the book, uh, like when Moses is in the desert and he sees the burning bush um, in his peripheral vision. Uh, in some translations, it says, Moses says to himself, I must turn aside to see the strange sight, right? You know, this burning bush. So we play with the idea eccentric that it's the strange sight. It's the sacred interrupting my life. But the, the way I really use the word eccentric there is geometrical. The sense that our attention gets turned kind of inward and that these experiences have to come from outside of the, the normal realm of perception. And so they are experienced as, as interruptions, um, that, that something comes to me so rather than me kind of conjuring up this experience, I am um, interrupted by a sacred moment. Um, and, and if you think about your life, we can all think about those eccentric experiences where you're just kind of moving through your day and you were interrupted um, by a, a feeling, um, stunned by something beautiful, um, moved uh, in your heart by bearing witness to some act of kindness like like we are things are coming to us eccentrically all the time and so the, the point of the book is to kind of widen our view to say hey maybe that's not like the audible voice of god like johnny cash hearing it but when you're interrupted by a sunset or a moment of peace or joy or awe or beauty um, or conviction, right? Like God puts something on your heart that, that like you must take action. And if we feel convicted uh, to, to engage in the world in a kind of a righteous way, that these moments are all, that's, that's all God coming to us. And so if we learn to expand um, our definition of what God's, what God uh, looks like in our world, then we realize that we're, we're encountering God all the time we're being interrupted by sacred moment moments fairly consistently yeah that's beautiful and um 
something I think I sent you by email, but um, Father Andrew Lyot talks about this, um, quoting Father Pavel Florensky, and he goes through the history of philosophy with Kant and the, this notion of antinomies and how Florensky sort of turned this on, it, on its head. So God reveals himself through these different ways that might not always be audible, as you say. And that's actually um, a facet of his love and respect for the creature because that stops it him from becoming like a simple object like a mathematical formula that we must accept and is actually affirmative of the creature and part of the glory of the creature that god would reveal himself in such a way which i think mm -hmm. is fascinating to think about in line with your book mm -hmm. and um i'm grateful for that perspective and widen our scope so thank you yeah. for that, richard and um I want to ask you next then about your own life. How have you found God working amongst the, the downtrodden in prison and other unexpected places, perhaps? Yeah, so one of the things that was, you know, we earlier I was describing that kind of progressive uh, trajectory in Christianity, uh, kind of a political progressivism, where we start kind of unpacking our faith um, as merely social justice. Um, and so, you know, I, and you see this a lot in progressive Christian spaces where, where you know, there's, there's a, a lot of doubt. And so the metaphysical freight of Christianity is hard to carry, you know, but, but if Jesus is just really like a social justice warrior sticking up for the victims of the oppressed, well, I can do that. Like if that's what Christianity is, you know, sticking up for the oppressed, then count me in. I'm a Jesus follower. Mm -hmm. And so, uh and that's kind of where I was like, like I had kind of in the early years of my writing uh, on my, on my blog, I was kind of unpacking my faith that way. And so my social justice impulses took me to a prison um, and to worship at a church that reaches out to very poor and homeless friends. But what I discovered, and I've written about this in my book, reviving old scratch um, demons and the devil for doubters and the disenchanted was that when I, when my my progressivism took me to the margins of society what i discovered on the margins of society was an enchanted experience that's not just locally in my town that's a global phenomenon that on the edges of the global society um, that enchantment thrives and in many ways disenchantment is a product of the western educated affluent countries like we're the weird ones and in fact there's a whole psychological literature called weird psychology have you ever heard of that weird psychology so weird stands for all capital letters um, western industrialized educated rich democracies right the west right and and what makes the west weird is the enlightenment right our our disenchantment is weird we we take it as normative so we're all these kind of western you know educated people and we're like we don't believe in god anymore like who could believe in these things you know and we think this is you know like with the new atheists we think this is you know the normal thing because we're western and we still have this kind of colonial imagination that the Western experience is definitive. But then you get into South America and Africa and Asia and the East, all of that, the rest of the world, the non-weird world, very enchanted. Mm -hmm. So there's some irony there to me is how, how progressive Christianity pushes to the margins and then gets to the margins and realize we're the weird ones and that's what that was and that was my experience like so i went out to the prison and, and the reason i wrote my book about the devil is because like i had to make sense of what was happening like like i was like i don't know if i believe in the devil like that's a little too enchanted for me so i i disenchanted my view of evil so most a lot of christians have a very disenchanted view of evil evil is just you know social injustice oppression we don't need all the metaphysical, spiritual, spooky stuff, right? We can get, we can disenchant it. But then I went out to the prison and like the, the, the prisoners were talking about the devil all the time. Like they were like, no, no, the devil is like a real thing. And, and, and they were asking me to pray over them. Like, like, I feel like I'm in a fight with the devil. And they're asked, could you, pr could you pray over me? 
like a prayer of protection. And I'm like, I don't even know if I believe in the devil. But, but so here I am being asked to be pastorally useful. I also don't want to be colonial. I don't want to be elitist and say, well, well, prisoners, let me as an elite educated person explain your superstition to you. Like I wanted to go in there with some kind of cultural humility and say, maybe I am the one that's weird. Maybe I need to check some of my own skepticism and listen to what they're experiencing and honor it rather than explain it away with some kind of scientific new atheism kind of materialistic perspective and listen and, and so I wrote a book. Of, so there I was. I was a progressive Christian, kind of a leader in the progressive Christian world. And I wrote a book about the devil. And and a lot of my people who have been following me, like the book hit them like out of left field. They're like, what, what, um, what are you writing about the devil for? Right, right. Like, 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 like we, we've, we, we subscribe to uh, an educated, um, uh, intellectually, sophisticated christianity you don't write about the devil that's too enchanted anyway so to answer your question you know like those experiences taught me that um maybe i had something to learn about enchantment from the marginalized and the oppressed maybe i am along with a lot of the western world weird um we're not the norm we're the weird ones and maybe we need to go uh, learn some lessons from our enchanted brothers and sisters from global Christianity. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you, Richard. And um, I expect that on two levels, even from my studies, um, you see that in people re like Rene Girard and um, Marcia Eliade, how they have went through history and shown how much of an animal an anomaly our modern Western secularist yeah. mindset is. And even the fact that it, it's kind of a Gnosticism, this notion of enlightenment, this disembodied reason that can see through, you know, everything through history and um, has these many questionable uh, conceptions. But uh, then at the personal level, coming from Ireland, our Celtic Christianity is what, kind of like what you describe in the book. You've got these magic wells and everything. So that, that's the milieu I grew up in. And my fiance, she's from Zimbabwe, and um, she'll tell me about Juju and all of these wonderful ideas from Africa yeah. too, and how different that is from this um, modern dominant secularist model. And then um, there's this lady, African-American lady, Chloe Valdere, who's written about how this older conception from the Enlightenment is actually being prolonged, continued with our modern um, notions of social justice and activism, which is disembodied in contrast with what you're describing, which is actual embodied uh, mm -hmm. spiritual reaching out to people and everything. But this kind of Facebook activism, how that's actually a continuation in some ways of the Enlightenment project, which I think is a fascinating perspective mm -hmm. on her, her theories, the enchantment theory. So I think that's in line with your work too. Um, I want to ask you next about Flannery O'Connor, whom I love, and um, how the Christian faith can then enchant the body and what is materialism lacking here despite its name? Yeah, so the story I tell about Flannery O'Connor is um, she was at this. Um, so for those who don't know, Flannery O'Connor is the kind of... Um, she wrote in like 1950s um, in America, Southern writer, but she was a Catholic writer, often writing about Protestant, the Protestant American South. So kind of interesting mix there. And anyway, she was at a uh, kind of an elite um, cocktail party in New York City, and people were talking about the Catholicism and the Eucharist, and O'Connor was a Catholic, and, and uh, she was kind of the only believer there and so she was kind of put in the position to be the one who maybe defend the eucharist and one of the people there at the cocktail party said you know that they felt that the eucharist was a beautiful symbol and then flannery o'connor's famous uh quip in response was well if it's just a symbol uh to hell with it and again that goes to the point we're making earlier about that protestant shift where where the sacrament lost its mystical aspect and became just a 
a symbol, um, a mental um, sign of remembrance. And, and, and so, and she was reclaiming, right? It's not just a symbol. It is miraculous. It's, it's, right through the catholic doctrine of transubstantiation that becomes the literal right some a miracle is happening in that point and so i quote her to talk about that kind of stubborn commitment to keeping um, the material and the spiritual wedded together um and, and you talked a little bit about um mentioned celtic christianity so that's a terrifying conversation to write a chapter about celtic christianity to talk about you know and actually person from Ireland. So I, I'm curious about what you thought about that chapter. But but one of the things I pointed out about the Celtic religious experience is its its way of seeing God not just come through the sacraments, but come to us through the natural world. So there is an embrace in how the creation itself mediates the presence of God. And you see that you see that in other locations of Christianity to be clear, but the, but the Celtic Christianity had a real embrace of just like the incarnational joys um, of, of the world as, as, as sacramental, right? As locations of divine encounter um, or that idea of a thin space where in a particular m m physical location, the, the boundary between the spiritual and the physical has been reduced um, and it has come close. Uh, and so, yeah, to me, that Flannery O'Connor quip is trying to kind of keep hold of that, that sacred intersection between the spiritual and the physical, most clearly seen in the Eucharist, but to me, is, a, is a, a, an imaginative model for all of life. Um, that to me is so expanding out from the Eucharistic imagine, imagination, I would say, Maybe I, maybe I kind of say, it, I don't say it this way in the book, but I'd say it out loud right now. Maybe what we're trying to cultivate is a Eucharistic imagination for life, right? The Eucharist is just a special instance of the way we should see all of life um, as a moment of divine encounter and thanksgiving and praise for that encounter, because that's what Eucharist means, um, thanksgiving. Yeah, that's magnificent. One of my favorite writers is um, Father Alexander Schmemann, and that's central yeah. to his work. So I 100% agree with you there. And um, how even with that sacramental ontology, these aren't just disembodied signs like I learned in my very postmodern um, signs signified kind of courses, but the sign actually partakes in this greater yeah. reality with our sacraments and everything. Mm -hmm. So um, in line with that, I guess I want to ask you about Tolkien and um, what the famous J.R.R. Tolkien had to say about reenchantment and the power of things like fairy tales in this um, sacramental view of the world. Yeah, so... Maybe your readers know, um, but Tolkien had this famous essay um, called On Fairy Stories, and it was a scholarly presentation he made for the value of fairy stories um, for adult and scholarly consideration. And, and his argument was that fairy stories are practices of attention. Um, they train us to see the world. And, and two of the ones I focus on in, in the book are the first one is recovery that life has this taken for granted aspect that we become bored, habituated to the things in life, even the things that we care most about, especially people we love. There, there becomes a kind of a routine that dulls our senses. And his argument is that fairy stories um, help us practice recovery to where we are surprised anew by the miracle that's right in front of us. This is also something that G.K. Chesterton talks about in his book, Orthodoxy, to where we see a sunrise and we become habituated to it. Um, but, but fairy stories help us realize that, no, there's kind of something miraculous about each particular sunrise. And so that's one aspect that I talk about in the book about fantasy and fairy stories kind of uh, help us recover surprise um, again, um, or this is like, right, uh, Lewis's Narnia, right? We, we walk through the wardrobe door and we find ourselves surprised to be in Narnia. And, and if we think through our lives as like any, any if, I'm, if I'm attentive to that moment, um, then any interaction could be moving into Narnia, right? I, I, if I learn to see it properly in its full sacred significance. 
So I can sit down with coffee with my wife, you know, in the morning, and that can just be just another Wednesday morning, right? Another boring old Wednesday morning. But if I learn to see it like a fairy tale, right? Through a fairy story lens, then suddenly this encounter with my wife again is re-experienced as a romance. It's, it's, it's miraculous again. Um, it's surprising and fresh again. And fairy stories help us recover that maybe childlike sacramental wonder. The other thing I talk about is Tolkien's um, idea of what's called the eucatastrophe. So the cata catastrophe is the Greek, the Greek word catastrophe means sudden turn. And usually a catastrophe is a bad sudden turn. And so Tolkien affixed the Greek word you, E-U to catastrophe called the you catastrophe, which is the good catastrophe. And this is the sudden surprising turn of grace, not tragedy, but surprising rescue. And so I use the you catastrophe to talk about how that expectation of grace and, and openness to be surprised by the interruption of grace is a critical aspect to enchantment. Earlier, I talked about like joy and gratitude um, and, and uh, a meaning in life that comes to us as a gift. But there's also hope. I spend time out at a prison, so hope is also a big deal. So I talk about how this ex I connect that eccentric posture of looking outward to um, the the expectation of a good catastrophe coming to us. So I also kind of describe it as the outward turn. Modern the modern ego is very internally focused. And when we turn inward, we, we kind of, what's well, kind of like a, like a, a body of water that doesn't have um, any outlet. It gets stagnant. Like if a body becomes insulated, it becomes stagnant. So we all, we need input from the outside. And so that's that kind of posture of receiving gifts of grace being interrupted by God. Um, and so as we go through the day, rather than ruminating in our heads, we're looking outward for signs Right, we were talking about that those sacramental signs that are in the world, um, that posture. So I'm kind of talking about a kind of a psychological orientation um, towards surprise, than uh, introverted rumination, which is kind of the hallmark of the modern self. Marvelous, thank you, Richard. And um, you describe mattering in the in the book. Can you tell us about um, mattering and um, how that uh, grace is stronger than shame, and how we might understand that? Yeah. So I was uh, we were earlier talking about like self esteem and how most of us trying to build our our uh, identities on this metric of self esteem. Which, and I, you know, we pointed out how that's kind of doomed to failure because self-esteem is always going to be a volatile metric of how well you're doing. And so psychologists have been studying this variable called mattering. And mattering is just what it says. It is just this conviction, this kind of durable, steady conviction that you matter, that your life has significance and value no matter your circumstance. And so it is unconditional where self-esteem is conditional up and down Mattering is unconditional. And, and I connect it to grace and the eucatastrophe and the eccentric experience because mattering um, just has to be received as a gift. Um, it, it can't be uh, performed for. Uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't do a dance to get it. That's the point. Um, that's self-esteem. You got to do some sort of dance to get the you know, to get the prize and you, and you win or you fail, but you're doing the dance, but mattering is just this, like, you don't have to do a dance. Um, and even when you stumble and fall and can't dance, you still matter. And so that that's and Christians have a word for it. It's called grace. It's a, it's a gift that you just accept. And, and because it's a gift, it, it is, um, it's resilient. It, you, you can't lose it because it wasn't yours to win in the first place. And, if, and, and therefore, it's not anything you can ever lose. So in the Christian imagination, right, this is 
the idea from Genesis that you were created in the image of God. And because of that, or, or we talked about earlier about like you have a soul, right? These are the enchanted things that, that are just create that sense of durable significance uh, called mattering. Yeah, that's beautiful. That reminded me of the wonderful work of Father Henri now and who I love and mm -hmm. his central emphasis on that we're God's beloved and how liberating this all is. Yeah. So um, next, I want to ask you, you just say about the, sometimes the facts aren't enough. And um, I want to ask you in line with that, how, what role has dignity played in the history for, for the slaves, um, for example, of older days, right down to the downtrodden today? Well, yeah, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about why does enchantment thrive, thrive on the margins. And I think one of the reasons why enchantment thrives on the margins is because when you're on the margins of society, um, you cannot peg your dignity um, to the metrics of the culture, the honor shame metrics of the culture at large. OK, mm -hmm. so if you think about so I write about the, 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 the slave experience in the United States and how the slaves were attracted to Jesus. And, and, and so wh why were they attracted to Jesus? And, and the answer that comes from within the slave experience, so this isn't me as a white person saying what, right, from, from black authors, the, 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 the significance of the African-American church uh, in the United States was, is that in God, the slaves found a transcendent ground of dignity that, that immunized them from the shaming of a white supremacist society. Right, because if you're if you're trying to gauge your your dignity on self esteem, and all the metrics of your culture say you're on the low end of the totem pole of the honor shame, well then shame is the only thing that you're going to internalize. You know, like you're you're a black slave in a white supremacist America was just being fed a constant cultural diet of shame that you are inferior. But in the Christian experience, they found a ground of mattering, that, right? That they were God's beloved, to borrow what you said about now, right? That they knew that they were valuable in a child of God, that that made them resilient to the shame of the larger culture. And that still happens. Like, I see that every day out of the prison. Like, the men in the prison, from factual social metrics, they are the waste of society. I mean, they were literally warehoused for decades in an institution called the prison. Well, what, what gives them dignity, right? Well, they just got to, and, 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 and what I see every week is God, right? They see themselves as a child of God. And so that even though they've made horrible mistakes in their life, and even though that they will have no real future, that the, the the one you and I could look forward to, hopefully, their life is still valuable because God um, says they matter. And, and that's a large part of why, well, it's like when Jesus says, I always felt kind of offended by this in, in Luke, when Jesus goes to Nazareth and preaches his sermon, um, he, he quotes Isaiah, do you remember this? He reads the text of Isaiah and he says, you know, the, the, you know, the, I, I've come here to proclaim release to the captives and, and sight to the blind. And then at the end, he says, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And I'm like, well, that doesn't seem to be a very good message. You know, like <laughs> if I was poor, I'd, I'd want some cash, you know, <laughs> but it says the poor have the good news preached to them. And I always felt back in my kind of progressive Christian days that that seemed kind of like a, a poor prize. But then when you spend time on the margin of society and you see the way the gospel combats their shame, how the gospel says that even in their oppressed situation that they matter, that the gospel grounds their dignity. Like I, I get what Jesus was saying. You know, I get what Jesus was saying there, that that the shamed of the earth are told that they are loved um, and the psychological impact that that has and continues to have um, is just a, a beauty, beautiful thing to behold. Yeah, amen. That's wonderful. Thank you, Richard.